Yeah. Respiratory system function. This slide represents a respiratory system. Please be familiar with all the parts in the system. As air enters the body through the nose and the mouth, it goes into the throat. The throat has two passageways, one for air and one for flu food. In the throat is the epiglottis, which covers the trachea when you swallow. This prevents food from entering into the lungs. And then the trach is the upper part of the respiratory system that contains the vocal cords. Additionally, we have the trachea, which is the windpipe, which is the windpipe that directs the air into the lungs, and the bronchi that are passages through which the air enters the lungs. In the lungs, oxygen is transferred to the blood and carbon dioxide is removed. The diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle that helps separate the lungs from the abdomen. Primary functions of the respiratory system include providing oxygen for the tissues for metabolism and removing carbon dioxide from the blood. Other functions include helping with the sense of smell, producing speech, maintaining an acid-base balance, and maintaining body water levels and heat. The upper respiratory tract includes the nose, the sinuses, the pharynx, the larynx, and the epiglottis. We'll discuss this more in depth on another slide. The lower respiratory tract contains the alveolar ducts and the alveolar. In addition, there are type 2 alveolar cells that help secrete surfactant necessary to keep the alveoli from collapsing. During the respiratory process, negative pressure develops in the lungs. This draws the air from outside the body into the lungs as air passes through the bronchioles into the alveoli to oxygenate the body tissues. At the end of inspiration, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles relax and the lungs recoil. Air with the waste in it moves from the alveoli to the atmosphere as expiration occurs passively. Let's just recap this a bit. So negative pressure in the lungs draws air from the area of greater pressure in the atmosphere or outside the body into the area of lesser pressure. During inspiration, the diaphragm descends into the abdominal cavity so the lung can expand. In the lungs, air passes through the bronchioles to the alveoli, which oxygenates the tissues of the body. At the end of inspiration, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles relax and the lungs recoil or retract. As the lungs recoil, pressure in the lungs is now greater than that outside the body or in the atmosphere. This causes the air in the alveoli, which contains those waste products of carbon dioxide, to move out of the lungs as part of exhalation. Effective gas exchange depends on distribution of gas ventilation and blood perfusion in all portions of the body. Most oxygen is carried to the blood bound to the iron of hemoglobin in the red blood cells. Most carbon dioxide is carried as bicarb in the blood. These ions form when carbon dioxide enters the red blood cell, is converted to carbonic acid, and to form bicarb ions and hydrogen ions. Because of its role in regulating the amount of carbon dioxide or acids in the body, the respiratory system is important in maintenance of acid-base balance. This is measured by pH and normal is 7.35 to 7.45. When you think respiratory acidosis, think hypoventilation. This is any decrease in the rate or efficiency of respirations that allows excessive carbon dioxide or acids to accumulate in the blood, lowering the hydrogen ion concentration and the pH. This can occur as a consequence of things like pneumonia, pneumothoraxis, collapsed lung, mid-abdominal incisions, narcotics, or sleeping pills. The patient is hypoventilating, causing retention of too much carbon dioxide. This is going to make the patient have a headache and feel sleepy and confused. They're gonna be hard to arouse. And as they continue to hypoventilate, it's going to get worse and worse. They're going to get sleepier. The muscles are going to get more relaxed, more um, harder to work. Signs and symptoms again are headache, sleepiness, and confusion. If not corrected, it could lead to a coma. 
patient's going to be hypoxic, so they're going to need oxygen. Early signs and symptoms of hypoxia are restlessness and tachycardia. So when you see a restless patient, think hypoxia first. They're going to have increased levels of carbon dioxide, a decreased level of consciousness, increased levels of carbon dioxide, and decreased level of oxygen. Carbon dioxide and oxygen have an inverse relationship. We need to fix the breathing problem, treat the pneumonia, resolve, and get rid of the secretions by postural drainage, percussion, vibration, deep breathing exercises, suctioning fluids, elevating the head of the bed, and incentive spirometer, spirometry. For respiratory alkalosis, when you think about respiratory alkalosis, think about hyperventilation. The patient is breathing too fast and they're losing acids or carbon dioxide quickly. Less carbon dioxide in the blood means fewer hydrogen ions and that pH is going to rise. The patient may be hysterical. This could be caused by an acute aspirin overdose. The client is breathing too fast and removing too much acid. They're going to have vasoconstriction of the cerebral vessels and this is going to cause them to feel lightheaded or faint. They may have numbness around the mouth, numbness and tingling in the fingers and the toes. The kidneys will take hours or maybe even days to kick in. So your patient needs to breathe into a paper bag or cup their hands and breathe into that or maybe a non rebreather mask to try to return some of that acid back into the lung. You may have to calm the patient down to, to decrease their respiratory rate. This may even include giving them a sedative and you have to monitor those ABGs. Although it's not a common condition, respiratory alkalosis may occur during states of anxiety, hyperventilation, or when the patient is acclimating to a high altitude. That hyperventilation, remember, is going to cause those acids to leave the body. The respiratory system also has to compensate for pH changes that are metabolic. That is, due to other reasons besides respiratory. Metabolic acidosis occurs when the concentration of hydrogen ions in the body is above normal due to a low bicarb buffer. Common causes include diabetic ketoacidosis, starvation, severe diarrhea. The cells in um, diabetic ketoacidosis are starving for glucose or energy, so this causes the body to break down fat and produce ketones. Ketones are acids, so this causes the um, acid level to go up in the body. In renal failure, the kidneys can't remove those acids or filter them out, so this can increase the amount of acids in the body. And in severe diarrhea, the bicarb in the lower tract leaves the body quickly, causing that metabolic acidosis. So signs and symptoms will depend on the cause. In diabetic ketoacidosis, we'll see Kussmaul's respirations, dehydration, and hyperglycemia. Also with these patients, uh, they're at risk for hyperkalemia, so we have to monitor for that. Remember, as the patient becomes more acidic, uh, the potassium level is going to rise. So we may see muscle twitching, muscle weakness, flaccid paralysis, and now the patient is at increased risk for arrhythmias. We'll also see an increase in the patient's respiratory rate as the body tries to remove some of those acids. And then we have to treat the problem. So if it's diabetic ketoacidosis, we're going to give insulin and fluids. And if it's anorexia, then we may have to give TPN or some sort of form of nutrition. So in this case, respiratory compensation involves increasing the rate and depth of respiration to exhale more carbon dioxide or acid. And that's going to decrease the ion formation and raise the pH back towards normal. Metabolic alkalosis can be caused by excessive vomiting, over ingestion of antacids, um, because we have too much base, um, 
maybe the, during the code, we give the patient IV bicarb and we give too much. So symptoms are going to depend on the cause, but we're always going to observe for level of consciousness. The patient may have alternate alterations. Um, the serum potassium is going to go up in metabolic acidosis. So in alkalosis, that potassium is going to go down. We're going to monitor these patients for muscle cramps and life-threatening life -threatening arrhythmias, and we need to fix the problem. Because their potassium levels go down in metabolic alkalosis, we also may need to replace the potassium. So remember that metabolic acidosis, we're going to see hyperkalemia, and in metabolic alkalosis, we're going to see hypokalemia. So as the patient becomes alkalotic, again, the lungs are going to compensate and they're going to decrease the rate of the breathing and increase um, to retain carbon dioxide in the body. And it, this will increase the formation of hydrogen ions that will eventually lower the pH. Respiratory compensation for an ongoing metabolic imbalance such as kidney failure will never be complete because the amount of carbon dioxide that may be exhaled or retained is limited. At most, respiratory compensation will only be about 75% effective. Aging effects. So as the body ages, we see that the elasticity of the lungs will decrease, vital capa capacity decreases, the amount of blood of oxygen in the blood levels decrease, and the stimulating effects of carbon dioxide decrease. This puts the patient at risk for respiratory tract infections. Other changes that we may be um, seeing in related to age are changes in the anatomical structure. Now, I know most of you have seen these older women and they have that hunchback, they're bent over. And when you see them with that hunchback, what is that doing? Well, it's putting pressure around the lungs, all right, and the rib cage, and basically the, these patients are not able to fully expand their lungs when they breathe. As we age, the bones become thinner and weaker, and this results in structural changes to both the rib cage and the spine, known as kyphosis and scoliosis. These structural changes actually reduce the functional space needed for the lungs to properly expand and contract, and this causes breathing to become more difficult and labored. Upper respiratory symptoms may include things such as headaches, sinus tenderness, nosebleeds, or voice changes. Remember that sometimes voice changes and sinus issues can be a sign of cancer. With lower respiratory symptoms, we're more likely to see shortness of breath, cough, sputum, night sweats, chills, fever, signs and symptoms of confusion, lightheadedness, or restlessness. When talking to the patient about a history, be sure to get a thorough history of smoking and uh, exposures to environmental smoke, airborne pollutants, or allergies. When dealing with the smoking, you need to know the number of packs per day and the number of years that they smoked. Also, you'll need to know any current medications or inhalers that are in use. Other risk factors for respiratory issues include allergies, chest injury, living in crowded conditions, exposure to environmental chemicals, pollutants, smoking, and use of chewing tobacco as well as surgery. For assessment, we use the what's up method. Where is it? Where are you feeling the discomfort? How does it feel? Are there any factors that aggravate or alleviate it? In other words, anything that makes it worse or better. How is the timing? When does it come on? Is it more at night, more in the morning, throughout the day, when you're only when you're doing specific activities? And what is the severity of it? And any other useful data you can gather. Remember that the patient's perception is key. Um, generally, patients don't complain of things until it starts to affect their activities of daily living. So how is this affecting the patient's life? Inspect. Inspect carefully. Make sure that you're looking for symmetry. 
Symmetry is the ability of the chest to properly rise and fall together. And uh, also, this can be measured with excursion also. You want to see if the, che if the, test che <laughs> the chest is uh, expanding and recoiling symmetrically. You're looking for dyspnea or shortness of breath. Any use of accessory muscles. So you'll see this with nasal flaring. Uh, you'll see retractions around the sternocleidal muscle, muscle, around the trachea area, and also in the areas of the rib cage. And look at the patient's color. Be sure to observe the respiratory rate and the rhythm. How about the chest shape? Chest shapes tend to be more round in things like emphysema, and this because air is being trapped inside the chest. When the patient breathes out, they're not able to release all of that air because at the end of expiration, the chest um, is inside the chest, the coil is collapsing, and that retains air in the chest. This causes this patient to have a hyperinflated chest, and that means basically that air is trapped in there, and so it's reshaping the chest into a more rounded or a barrel shape. Be sure to palpate. Uh, you can palpate at the sinuses. Also, uh, respiratory excursion can be palpated. This is a measurement of chest expansion on inspiration. It may be helpful if hypoventilation or asymmetry is suspected. You can also check for crepitus. Crepitus is going to feel like rice krispies under the skin. Uh, the skin is going to feel real delicate, and um, it almost feels like those bubble packs when you push on it. Uh, this can occur when air leaks into the subcute tissue because of a pneumothorax or a chest tube that's leaking. Percussion. Resonance. That's a normal chest sound that's usually heard over the um, lung fields, and it's usually heard everywhere except over the heart. It will sound like a deep, full, and reverberating sound, and air-filled spaces usually act as a resonant cavity. Now, we may hear hyper-resonance, which is resonance increased above the normal sound, and then it may be low-pitched on percussion. Uh, this can occur in the chest as a result of overinflation of the lung, like an emphysema or a pneumothorax. A dull sound uh, can, is usually heard over organs. It shouldn't be heard over the lung fields. If it is heard over the lung fields, it may be that the fluid has replaced the air in the lung fields or an infiltration has occurred. So the patient may have something like a pleural effusion or a pneumonia. Flat sounds are usually heard over solid areas like bones and should not be heard over the lung fields. When they are heard over the lung fields, it could indicate pneumonia atelectasis, pleural effusions, pneumothorax, or asthma. You need to auscultate the lungs and you're looking for normal breath sounds versus adventitious breath sounds. They need to be compared bilaterally. Adventitious breath, adventitious breath sounds are abnormal sounds that are heard over the lungs and the airway. And they may be described as crackles, wheezes, strider, friction rubs, diminished or absent. Strider typically indicates an obstruction and sometimes is described as a crowing-like sound. Diminished or absent breath sounds are often heard in things like pneumothorax and may represent no airflow through the lungs. Lab tests are also used to help rule out different things. Uh, CBCs help us rule out infections. ABGs are used to evaluate the acid-base balance, the amount of oxygenation and bicarb present in the body. A D-dimer may be used if we suspect a pulmonary embolism or a blood clot. Cultures are also obtained. Um, for these, we generally can get a sputum specimen. They're done early in the morning. Uh, make sure that the patient's mouth is cleaned prior to um, completing the specimen. It should be done sterile, and we can get it from suctioning or expectoration, or expectoration after respiratory treatments. So we always collect the sputum prior to starting antibiotics. Uh, once the culture is collected, transport it to the lab immediately. 
and um, that will help us identify if there's any organisms or abnormal cells. And then we're measuring SpO2. Diagnostically, we may do a chest x-ray. Uh, this can tell us about the location and the appearance of the lungs. Sometimes we can see infiltrates or fluid in the lungs. CT scans, which can help show cancers, pneumonia, emphysema. BQ scans are ventilation perfusion scans, and these view the blood flow to the lungs. Pulmonary function tests are used to help diagnose COPD and other lung diseases. Angiography, this involves an x-ray exam of the pulmonary vessel after an IV solution is administered. It's used to help diagnose pulmonary embolism or other pulmonary vessel disorders. And then a bronchoscopy, which uses a flexible endoscope to examine the larynx, trachea, and the bronchiotrach. It can be used diagnostically to visualize or obtain specimens. It can also be used therapeutically to remove obstructions, foreign bodies, or thick secretions. Therapeutic measures. One therapeutic measure we may use is behavior modification. This helps the patient identify triggers to smoking, such as eating a meal or experiencing stress. We try to substitute those triggers with other healthier behaviors, such as going for a walk. Counseling by uh, a healthcare worker can also help um, increase the patient's chance of uh, quit smoking. Sometimes smoking is triggered by psychological or other issues, and if the patient can vent or talk to someone, they might be able to get rid of that trigger. Setting the quit date. The cold turkey method is more effective than slow tapering. However, the patient may choose to taper first. Nicotine replacement can help reduce withdrawal symptoms, and there's a multiple um, number of types out there. Drug therapy can also be used Bupropion may help reduce cravings, bear a nicotine attaches to nicotine receptors in the brain to help block nicotine and reduce its pleasurable effects, or hypnosis, which can help the person believe that smoking is undesirable. Smoking sensation is the most important intervention, if possible. And then the patient will also engage in things like deep breathing and coughing, which can help keep the airway clear of secretions. Some patients may have to do what we call a huff cough because they have that weak cough and the airways collapse easily. Uh, we also have other breathing exercisers and diaphragmatic and pursed lip breathing, with, which will help increase the effectiveness of breathing and reduce panic when shortness of breath or dyspnea occurs. The huff cough or the forced expiration technique is an alternative to deep coughing. <laughs> huff coughing involves taking a deeper breath than normal, using the diaphragm and the stomach muscles to make a series of exhalations with the airway open. The patient will make a huff, 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 or H sound, and then followed by diaphragmatic breathing and then a deep cough, if mucus is felt moving within the larger airways or the trach. Additional exercises include pursed lip breathing. Pursed lip breathing helps the patient control their breathing rate and any shortness of breath. It will help them to get air into their lungs and get the energy required to breathe. It also helps them feel more in control and makes it easier for them to do things. Positioning. Patients with shortness of breath are positioned to help conserve energy and expand the lungs to the maximum amount. They do not usually tolerate lying flat. They should be placed in Fowler's or semi-Fowler's position. This will help keep the abdominal contents away from the lungs and also help expand them. Some patients may choose to sit in a tripod position, leaning forward, placing their elbows on the knees or an over bedside table. This can help reduce shortness of breath or dyspnea. We also can use the good lung down theory. This is where patients who have a one-sided lung disease benefit from putting the good lung down in a lateral position, a sideline position with the good lung in a dependent position. Gravity will allow for greater blood flow to the good lung, increasing the O2 sats. 
These patients will also probably need supplemental oxygen, especially if the O2 sat is less than 90% on room air. Be sure that the MD order includes the rate and method of administration. Teach the patient about safety. Teach them to avoid smoking or using electrical equipment or performing other activities that may cause a spark or fire in the presence of oxygen. Nasal cannulas. For a nasal cannula to be effective, the patient must be able to breathe through their nose. One to six liters per minute is generally admitted, administered through the nasal cannula. Remember that the higher the rate, the more it may dry the nose and lead to nasal cavity breakdown. So some of these patients may need humidified oxygen. Simple masks. Simple masks are used when a higher O2 concentration is needed. They make some patients feel claustrophobic and must be replaced by a cannula when the patient eats. A simple face mask administers oxygen at a rate of 5 to 10 liters per minute and can deliver oxygen concentrations from 40 to 60 percent. Partial rebreather masks use a reservoir to capture some exhaled gas for rebreathing and can deliver oxygen concentrations of 50 percent or greater. Non-rebreather masks have one or both sides of the vents closed, which limits the amount of mixing of room air with oxygen. This is used to deliver, deliver oxygen concentrations of 70 to 100 percent. We also have something called a Venturi mask. A Venturi mask delivers oxygen concentrations of 100%. They can deliver um, an accurate concentration of oxygen. So these Venturi masks are often used with patients that have something like COPD or emphysema because in these patients, we can't really increase the flow or rate because of the respiratory drive shutting off. But if we can give them a higher concentration of oxygen, that's usually more effective. So remember with the patient that has COPD or emphysema, we may use a Venturi mask to deliver a more concentrated flow of oxygen. Transtracheal oxygen can also be administered. The transtracheal cath is a small tube surgically placed at the base of the neck directly into the trach. It can deliver oxygen for patients who are on long-term therapy at home. Nebulized mistreatments use a nebulizer to deliver medication directly into the lungs. This helps reduce systemic side effects. The most common administered are bronchodilators such as albuterol mixed with normal saline solution and sometimes supplemental oxygen. Others administered may be corticosteroids, mucolytics, and antibiotics. Bronchodilators are commonly ordered every four to six hours and as needed. In this picture, the patient uses a handheld reservoir with tubing and a mouthpiece to breathe in the medication. Meter dose inhalers can also administer topical medication directly into the lungs to help minimize systemic side effects. Medications that can be inhaled include corticosteroids, bronchodilators, and mast cell inhibitors. Meter dose inhalers use propellants to help deliver the medication. The client must be instructed carefully because improper use can reduce the effectiveness of the medication. The patient should avoid overuse of adrenergic bronchodilator inhalers. Patients with chronic lung disease tend to use extra puffs when they feel short of breath. These adrenergic bronchodilators can cause severe rebound bronchoconstriction and even death if used too often. How to use a meter dose inhaler with the spacer. Teach the patient to shake the medication. Then insert the mouthpiece of the inhaler into the rubber sealed end of the spacer. They will breathe all of the air out of their lungs and then put the spacer in the mouth between their teeth, making a tight seal around the mouthpiece with the lips. They should press the meter dose inhaler one time to release a spray of medication. The medicine will be trapped in the spacer. Then they will breathe in slowly and deeply. They should hold the breath for five to 10 seconds and then breathe out slowly. If they cannot hold their breath, they can breathe in and out slowly for three to five breaths. Incentive spirometers 
help encourage deep breathing at patients at risk for collapse of lung tissue or atelectasis. They are commonly ordered for post-op patients and patients are instructed to use them 10 times each hour while awake. Chest PT can also help our patients breathe. This provides postural drainage, percussion, and vibration to help move those secretions from deep inside the lungs out. These are great for a patient who has a weak or an ineffective cough or is at risk for retaining secretions. Patients who tend to retain secretions are those with COPD, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, or patients on ventilators, and they can really benefit from CPT. It's generally performed by a respiratory therapist or a specially trained nurse. Sometimes they may use something called a vest therapy or a chest vest, vest, which is an alternative to CPT. It can oscillate the chest wall or vibrate it to help loosen and remove those secretions. Another alternative to chest therapy is a small hand handheld device called a PEP device or a vibratory positive expiratory device. One brand is the flutter mucus clearance device. The patient blows into the mouthpiece and there's a heavy still ball in there. As it bounces around in the chamber, it sends vibrations into the airway, which help loosen the mucus. Blowing in the device also helps create positive pressure to open the airways. Diagnostic testing. One type of diagnostic testing is a thoracentesis. During the procedure, the doctor will insert a needle into the pleural space to remove fluid or air through aspiration. Fluid or air is trapped in that pleural space. The test can be diagnostic to determine the source of the fluid or therapeutic to remove the fluid and help reduce respiratory distress. It may also be performed to aspirate blood or air or inject medication. Thoracentesis is a sterile procedure. The patient may feel a pressure sensation, however severe pain is rare. Analgesics or anesthetics may be used if ordered before the procedure. Patients should be positioned in a sitting position, bending over the bedside table, and if they're not able to sit, we can place them sideline in the bed towards the unaffected side with the head of the bed elevated. Encourage the patient to relax during the procedure. They should not cough, breathe deeply, or move as they could as this could result in an injury by puncture. The patient should usually report immediate reduction of shortness of breath after the procedure. Apply the petroleum jelly dressing to the wound to prevent air leakage afterwards. Assess the vital signs, breath sounds, and the puncture site. Check MD orders. The site and the patient should be checked every 15 minutes times two, every 30 minutes times two, then every four hours times 24 hours. The patient is maintained on bed rest for one hour post-procedure. Post-procedure, an x-ray will be done to ensure that the lung was not punctured, causing a pneumothorax. Monitor the patient's respiratory status and for signs of a pneumothorax, air embolism, or pulmonary edema. Chest drainage helps remove air or fluid from the pleural space. It involves insertion of one or two chest tubes in the pleural space. Indications are collapsed lung, pleural effusion, penetrating chest injuries, or it may be needed during chest surgery. The tubes are inserted by the attending physician at the bedside or in surgery. If the surgeon is attempting to remove air as in a collapsed lung, the tube will be inserted in the upper anterior chest wall. If the physician is trying to remove fluid as a result of an injury, the tube will be placed in the lower lateral chest wall. If the surgeon needs to remove both air and fluid, two tubes will be inserted and joined with the Y connector. Petroleum jelly gauze and a sterile occlusive dressing are applied over the insertion site to prevent air leakage. If the dressing becomes soiled, do not change it, reinforce it, with additional chest, additional dressings and notify the RN. Two padded clamps are kept at the bedside 
for clamping the chest tube if the drainage system becomes accidentally disconnected. However, the tube should never be clamped more than a few seconds and check your policy to ensure that you are permitted to do this. This prevents air escape and could cause a buildup of air in the pleural space and create a tension pneumothorax, a life-threatening emergency. The chest drainage system includes a drainage chamber, which has a drainage collection chamber side and a suction chamber, and then there is also a water sill chamber. The drainage system will have one, two, or three bottles. The water sill chamber or the water sill bottle acts as a sill, allowing air to escape from the pleural space but preventing it from coming back in during the negative pressure of inspiration. When the system is first initiated, bubbling occurs with each exhalation until the lungs are re-expanded. Water in the tube will fluctuate up and down with each inspiration and expiration. This is called tidaling. When the lung is fully reinflated, the tidaling stops. If the tidaling stops before the lung is reinflated, the tubing should be checked for kinks or occlusions. If constant bubbling occurs, the system should be checked for leaks. Sometimes a suction source is needed to help speed up the lung reinflation. A separate bottle with tubing attached to the suctioning is used. The amount of suctioning will depend on the level of the water in the bottle, not the amount of suction on the machine. The suction level is ordered by the physician. Vig vigorous bubbling causes water evaporation, so if the water starts to evaporate, more must be added to maintain the correct amount of suctioning. Sometimes a third bottle is needed to help catch fluid drained from the pleural space. This drainage can be from a pleural effusion, chest trauma, or surgery, or just because of the insertion of the chest tube itself. The drainage chamber is not emptied when we measure drainage. Drainage levels in the amount of the bottle or the chamber are marked and then timed each shift to monitor the drainage. Drainage is documented as output on the INO record. If drainage suddenly increases or becomes extremely bloody, notify the physician. If the drainage chamber fills up, the chamber or unit will need to be changed. When taking care of these patients with the chest tube, you need to monitor respiratory rate, effort, symmetry, assess for things like shortness of breath, pain, anxiety, and other discomforts. Listen to those lung sounds. Initially, they might be muffled or absent on the side of the collapsed lung. Eventually, those sounds should return to normal as the lung reinflates. Make sure the dressings are intact and look for drainage. Reinforce the dressing if needed and notify the doc. Do not change the dressing unless you're specifically ordered and trained to do so. Palpate near the insertion site for signs of crepitus. Remember, that's going to be that snap, crackle, pop that you feel underneath the skin from possible leakage of the uh, chest tube or some other reason. Notify the doc or the RN immediately if the patient suddenly reports increasing shortness of breath or some other change in the patient's status. A full drainage chamber needs to be changed. When the reason for the chest tube is resolved, the doctor will remove it and place petroleum jelly gauze and a sterile dressing over the site. Continue to watch the patient for development development of crepitus and monitor the respiratory status and the dressing site. Check the system and the tubing. Check all tubing for leaks, kinks, breaks, or broken connections. Connections should be securely taped. Ensure there are no dependent loops of tubing and excess of tubing can be coiled on the bed. The drainage system is kept below the level of the patient's chest at all times. Check the system for cracks or leaks. Check the water sill chamber for correct water level and for titling unless the lungs are reinflated. Check the suction control chamber for gentle bubbling. Confirm that the amount of water is correct. Add the water if needed. Check and mark the amount of drainage in the collection chamber every eight hours and as needed or as ordered. Report any marked increase in bloody drainage. Record 
Record drainage as ordered. Document your findings. Stripping is a method <clears throat> that has been used in the past. However, it should only be done if it's ordered by the doctor and even then only with specific instructions. Milking is also no longer routinely done. If the tubing appears to be occluded, consult with the doctor for specific orders. Tracheostomy is a surgical opening at the base of the neck into the trach. It's permanent and there's a tube inserted into the opening to help maintain patency. Indications for a trachea include cancerous larynx removal, airway obstructions caused by a tumor or trauma, and difficulty clearing secretions from the airway, or sometimes they're used with patients who need prolonged mechanical ventilation. Nursing care of the trach includes suction and cleaning, providing communication techniques for the patient, and teaching. Trach parts. There are three main parts of the trach, the outer cannula, the inner cannula, and the obturator. The obturator guide is only used when we insert the trach and immediately removed after. It's kept at the bedside, commonly in a plastic bag taped to the wall above the bed for emergency use if the trach is accidentally dislodged. The outer cannula remains in place at all times, secured by ties to prevent dislodging. The inner cannula is removed at intervals, usually every eight hours and as needed for cleaning. Plastic tubes also may have balloon-like cuffs that are inflated to prevent air escape during mechanical ventilation. You'll know that the cuff is inflated if the small pilot balloon on the tubing used to inject the air is also inflated. Cuffs are deflated routinely to help prevent tissue damage. Some new trach tubes eliminate the need for the inner cannula. Because communication is a problem for a patient with a tracheostomy, the Passimer tracheostomy speaking valve is an option. Normally with the trach tube, air is diverted out of the tube rather than past the vocal cords. The fenestrated tubes have openings or a fenestra in the cannula that allows air to flow up into the larynx for, spe for speaking. The patient simply plugs the opening of the tube while speaking to divert the air through the fenestra. This is a special valve. It allows air into the tracheostomy during inspiration, but closes and redirects air up around the tracheostomy tube through the vocal cords and out the nose and mouth on expiration, allowing the patient to speak. For the valve to be used safely and effectively, the tracheostomy tube must be small enough for air to flow around it or fenestrated to allow air to flow up through the vocal cords. If cuffed, the cuff must be completely deflated. Because communication is problematic for a patient with a tracheostomy, the Passimer tracheostomy speaking valve is an option. Normally with the trach tube, air is diverted out of the tube rather than past the vocal cords. Fenestrated tubes have openings or fenestra in the cannula that allow air to flow up into the larynx for speaking. The patient just plugs the opening of the tube while speaking and it diverts air through the fenestra. This is a special valve that allows air into the trach during inspiration, but closes and redirects the air around the trach tube through the vocal cords and out the nose and mouth on expiration, allowing the patient to speak. For the valve to be used safely and effectively, the trach tube must be small enough for air to flow around it, or it has to be fenestrated to allow air to flow up through the vocal cords. If it's cuffed, the cuff must be completely deflated. Nursing care for a trach should include the following. Suctioning to remove secretions. Signs that suctioning is needed is crackles or wheezes over the air fills. Hyperoxygenate the patient first. Coughing is the best way to clear those secretions and should be encouraged when the patient is able. Assess the lung sounds. Listening for adventitious breath sounds. Fluids should be encouraged. Fluids help hydrate the secretions, making it easier for them to cough up. Humidified oxygen or a room humidifier can also help prevent drying of the mucosa and the secretions. Patients should ambulate as able. If they're not able, 
You must turn them every two hours to help mobilize secretions. Clean the tracheostomy. This helps remove excess mucus and keeps the airway clean. When you suction the patient, be sure to use sterile technique. Do it only as needed. This helps clear the secretions from the airway without subjecting the patient to irritation or infection. Monitor and document the amount, color, and character of the secretions and report any change in the secretions, especially if they're accompanied by fever. Intubation by an ET tube. Patients in cardiopulmonary arrest are intubated during advanced cardiac life support. Patients undergoing general anesthesia during surgery are also intubated. Most patients that are intubated are also mechanically ventilated. Some patients have advanced directives indicating they do not wish to be intubated. Be familiar with the patient's wishes and bring them to the attention of the physician. Intubation is a short-term intervention. It can damage vocal cords and surrounding tissue. If long-term support is needed, a trach tube is placed. Mechanical ventilation provides ventilation or respirations. Mechanical ventilation provides respirations for patients unable to breathe effectively and on their own. It uses positive pressure to push oxygenated air through a cuffed ET or trach tube into the lungs at preset intervals. It's an invasive procedure. Indications for mechanical ventilation or mechanical respirations include some surgeries, after cardiac or respiratory arrest, for declining ABGs, ventilators can control or assist the patient's own respirations. When you're monitoring the ventilator, be sure to pay attention to the alarms. There are several types of alarms. When an alarm sounds, always check the patient first. That's a test question. A low pressure alarm senses reduced pressure in the system. This can be caused by disconnected tubes or leaks around the ET tube under inflated cuffs, or the patient may have attempted to remove the tube. You must know what a low pressure alarm is and why it's signaled. Test question. High pressure alarms can occur if there is more resistance to the airflow than normal. This might happen if the patient needs to be suctioned, if they're biting on the tube, coughing, or trying to talk, or if the tube is kinked or otherwise obstructed. Sometimes it can happen if the respiratory disease is getting worse and there is a decrease in the lung compliance or if there's water in the tubing. High pressure may be triggered also if the patient is anxious and not able to breathe in sync with the ventilator. A loss of power alarm may signal a power failure or a disconnected plug. Be aware of emergency power resources and be prepared to ventilate the patient manually if necessary. Volume and frequency alarms sound when the tidal volume or the number of breaths per minute fall outside the preset parameters. Remember to always check the patient first. If the patient is stable, then check the machine. Determine why the alarm is sounding and correct the prob problem quickly. If no cause can be found, disconnect the patient from the ventilator and call for help. Use a manual resuscitation bag until help arrives. Be aware of the alarms and why the alarm and what you have to do to correct them. You will be tested on this. Monitor the patient and the ventilator settings as prescribed. Responding to all alarms, keep the tubing free from any water accumulation and keep the airway free from secretion. Always keep a manual resuscitation bag at the bedside for emergencies. Help prevent ventilator associated complications like pneumonia. There are a couple ways you can do this. Keep the head of the bed at a 45 degree angle, which will help reduce the risk for aspiration. Provide oral care. Evidence has shown 
that when chlorhexidine solutions are used, it helps reduce the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Regular suctioning will help keep the airway clear. Good nutrition is also essential and has been shown to be related to eventual successful weaning. Before initiating any mechanical ventilation, you must be aware of any advanced directives that the patient may have and discuss these with the patient and the family because patients who have advanced directives may not wish to be intubated or mechanically ventilated. Please keep in mind that some patients that have an advanced directive may accept mechanical ventilation if it's a temporary measure and it may not be permanent. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation may also be selected as an alternative to intubation and mechanical ventilation if the patient's able to breathe on their own but just not able to maintain those normal blood gases. Indications for this are severe respiratory disease, sleep apnea, or some neuromuscular diseases that weaken the respiratory muscles like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. The advantages of this non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is that it's non-invasive. There are two basic types, continuous positive airway pressure, also known as a CPAP, or bilevel positive airway pressure, also known as BiPAP. For the CPAP, the patient receives the same amount of positive pressure throughout inspiration and expiration, and this prevents the airway from collapsing like it does in things such as COPD or emphysema or even asthma. Uh, problems with it is that we can have irritation to the skin from the mask, so the patient may need some sort of uh, skin barrier. With the BiPAP, the lower level of positive pressure is used on expiration. Patients can use this type of ther therapy nearly continuously removing it to eat or go to the bathroom. Some patients are able to breathe effectively on their own during a day and might only need it when they're sleeping. Other problems that may occur is we may have to find a way to prevent gastric dis distension. And one way to do this is by placing the patient in semi Fowler's position or consulting with the respiratory therapist to possibly adjust the air delivery pressure. Topical saline or special humidifiers may be needed on the machine to reduce nose and mouth dryness. Let's talk about the bronchoscopy. The bronchoscopy is a diagnostic test. It's sometimes used to obtain tissues for biopsy or to remove obstructions such as a mucus plug. It provides examination of the larynx, the trachea, and the bronchi with a fiber optic bronchoscope. Prior to the procedure, the patient must be MPO at least 6 to 12 hours prior and after the procedure until the gag reflex returns. These patients will be monitored for bronchospasms, bronchoperforation, dysrhythmias, fever, and hypoxemia. Notify the physician if fever, difficulty breathing, or other complications develop. These patients will receive conscious sedation. Pulmonary angiography is another diagnostic test. This helps examine pulmonary circulation. Dye is injected into the pulmonary artery. The client may feel the urge to cough during their procedure. Sometimes after the dye is injected, they may feel flushing, nausea, or a salty taste. Monitor the patient's vital signs. Be sure to avoid taking the blood pressure for at least 24 hours in the extremity used. Monitor peripheral neurovascular status of the affected extremity, including the temp, the sensation, the color, and the pulse. The patient may be at risk for cardiac arrhythmias. If the patient is taking metformin, they must hold it for at least 48 hours prior to the procedure. Also, be sure to question the patient prior to injection of the dye about shellfish and iodine allergies. A lung biopsy may be done to obtain lung tissue for analysis by culture. After the procedure, monitor the patient for signs of bleeding, respiratory distress, or a pneumothorax. 
A ventilation perfusion scan is normally done if a patient is suspected for a PE. It may also be used pre and post-op for evaluation of lung transplants. Pre-test scans are used to quantify lung function for the transplant. This evaluates blood flow to and from the lungs. After the procedure, instruct the client that the radionuclide clears from the body in about eight hours. Certain skin tests may also be performed like intradermal injections to help diagnose things like TB or other infectious diseases. After the procedure, the client should not scratch the site or wash it. Interpretation of the site is made in 24 to 72 hours depending on the test and what was prescribed. ABGs could also be done. Before the procedure, the Allen test will be done to determine the patency of the ulnar artery or to determine circulation of the ulnar artery. After the procedure, a pressure will be applied to the puncture site for five to 10 minutes or longer if the client is taking anticoagulants or has a bleeding disorder. Supplemental oxygen. A Venturi mask is most often used for patients with COPD. This allows a high flow of oxygen. We have to monitor the patient closely to ensure the accurate flow rate for the specific FiO2. Keep the orifice for the Venturi adapter open and uncovered. Ensure that the mask fits snugly and keep the tubing free of kinks. Assess the client for dry mucous membranes. Now we're going to talk about chest injuries for a minute. Pulmonary contusions. This is when uh, the patient gets some sort of blunt force or trauma to the chest. Um, they could be hit in the chest, kicked in the chest. Um, you know, somebody could stomp on their chest. Something could fall heavy, could fall on the chest. The patient uh, may experience dyspnea or shortness of breath, hypoxemia. Be sure that they have a patent airway and that they're having adequate ventilation. Um, that, you know, they're really getting that full chest expansion. This is where you can use your uh, excursion to, to measure for your respiratory excursion to see if this patient is ventilating adequately. Put the patient in high Fowler's position to expand the lungs. Administer oxygen as prescribed and then watch them for an increase in their respiratory rate. You're monitoring them for respiratory distress, use of those accessory muscles. Maintain them at bed rest and limit their activity. If they experience a pneumothorax with this injury, you need to put a dressing if they have an open chest wound over that chest wound and keep them on a high Fowler's position and then get them ready for chest tube placement. You also have to monitor these patients for subcutaneous emphysema. When you put that chest, um, that dressing over the chest wound, make sure that you um, leave one side open and tape three sides down. That'll allow air to escape, but won't let it back in. Acute respiratory failure. In this, um, what's happening here is two things. Either the patient has too much carbon dioxide in the blood or not enough oxygen. So it can be either way. Um, either the body is not removing enough carbon dioxide out of the blood or it's not putting enough oxygen in it. So this can result in hypercapnia or too much carbon dioxide in the blood um, where the PCO2 level is actually higher than 45 mm's and the patient starts to develop acidemia or acidosis. These patients are going to have shortness of breath, headache, restlessness, confusion, tachycardia, cyanosis, and alterations in their respirations and breath sounds. So for these patients, you're going to give oxygen to maintain that O2 sat level than higher than 60 or 70. Put the client in the high Fowler's position to expand the lungs. And then if indicated, we're going to get them ready for mechanical ventilation. The next topic we'll discuss is ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. These patients are going to have dyspnea. So they're going to have an increase in the rate of respirations, dyspnea, decreased breath sounds, and deteriorating blood gas levels. Why? Because with this tachypnea, they're going to be breathing fast, right? It's going to increase that respiratory rate. 
So along with that, they're probably going to be thrown off extra acid, and that's going to help change those blood gas levels. They're going to be hypoxemia, uh, decreased pulmonary compliance, and pulmonary infiltrates. They also are going to have decreased breath sounds, um, and even though they may have high oxygen concentrations coming in, they're still going to have hypoxemia. Interventions are to identify and treat the cause of the ARDS, administer oxygen as prescribed, put the client in high phallus position, and prepare them for intubation or mechanical ventilation using PEEP. Next, we're going to talk about asthma. What is it? In asthma, we have chronic inflammation of the airways. These patients are going to have absent or diminished breath sounds. Why? Because they have constriction in the airways and it's limiting that flow. They're going to use accessory muscles, nasal flaring, um, retractions around the rib cages, around the sternocleidal muscles, okay, prolonged exhalation, and they're going to have a decrease in their O2 sets. We have to make sure that that airway is patent. We want to give them humidified oxygen when possible. And we're going to give quick relief rescue medications such as uh, short-acting beta-2 agonists and corticosteroids. And then we're going to continuously monitor respiratory status. And we'll talk about um, these medications a little bit more as we're going on. But remember, for emergency relief, the main one is going to be your short-acting beta-2 agonist. Now, when we talk about beta-2 and beta-1, remember, beta-1 is for the heart, and we have one heart. Beta-2 is for the lungs, and we have two lungs. We got to teach these clients to stay away from things that trigger their asthma. Some things that might trigger their asthma are extreme changes in the temperature. So if the patient is going outside and it's extremely cold outside, they want to put a scarf or something over that face so that when they go out, that cold air doesn't just hit them right in the face and trigger an asthma attack. Also, they need to avoid other people that might have respiratory infections. And they should know how to recognize symptoms of a pending asthma attack and what medications they need to prescribe. Also, to keep those medications with them at all time and to properly store them to get maximum effectiveness out of them. You're also going to teach them how to use those inhalers because if the inhalers aren't used appropriately, it really won't help much with the asthma. These patients are also going to need adequate rest, sleep, and a well-balanced diet. COPD is progressive airflow limitation both in and out of the lungs. It's caused by elevated airway resistance and ir irreversible lung distension, and the patient will have uh, an imbalance in the ABGs. These patients may have barrel chest. Uh, they may use accessory muscles. Exertional dyspnea, meaning whenever they get up to do something, they get extremely short of breath, clubbing of the fingers. They have orthopnea, which happens when they're laying flat, and this can cause the person to either uh, sleep in a sitting up in a recliner or sleep propped up in bed. They'll also experience respiratory acidosis and hypoxemia. These patients will either need low flow oxygen, like two liters per minute, so we don't shut off the respiratory drive. Or remember, we could use that Venturi mask for a more concentrated flow of oxygen. We can teach them how to do that diaphragmatic abdominal pursed lip breathing techniques, put them in high Fowler's position, um, and teach them that tripod position with the leaning forward. Also, they need to uh, stop smoking, so we're going to talk to them about not smoking about signs and symptoms of respiratory infections and hypoxia. Remember, for hypoxia, uh, think restlessness. Instruct the client uh, to avoid exposures to others that might have infections and to places that are crowded with people and to adhere to the activity limitations so that they don't become over uh, exerted or too short of breath and also proper use of medications and inhalers uh, and oxygen therapy. Remember that they like to sometimes, because they feel short of breath all the time, take extra doses of those adrenergic bronchodilators and that can actually cause them to go into bronchoconstriction. 
Severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, is caused by a coronavirus. This coronavirus can lead to a life-threatening type of pneumonia. It begins with fever, feelings of discomfort, body aches, and mild respiratory symptoms. After a couple of days or up to a week, the patient may develop a dry cough and shortness of breath. It's spread by close person-to-person -person contact, and to prevent it, we need to avoid contact with anyone suspected of having SARS or traveling to countries with an outbreak of SARS or anybody who's had close contact with anybody in a crowded area where SARS exists. Frequent hand washing is extremely important for this. So pneumonia is something we see quite frequently. This is an infection or inflammation that causes the alveoli to fill up with fluid or pus, and it affects one or both lungs. Now, if those alveoli are filled up with fluid or pus, or if they're inflamed, it's going to be hard for them to exchange uh, gas correctly in those lungs. A, sputer, a sputum culture will help identify the organism. These patients are going to have fever, chest pain, sputum production. They can have a productive or a dry cough, bronchi, wheezing. They may have fever, trouble breathing, and pain around the ribs or the back. We're going to encourage them to cough, deep breathe, and use that incentive spirometer. And we want them to sit up or sleep in a semi fowler's position so they can expand those lungs and breathe. Uh, we need them to change positions frequently, ambulate as tolerated, drink lots of fluids up to three liters a day, and um, this is fed, spread by droplets. And we definitely want to prevent spread of infection with these patients by hand washing. So for client uh, teaching, we want to teach that patient the importance of receiving uh, immunizations as recommended, about the importance of rest, proper nutrition, adequate fluid intake, and about avoiding becoming chilled or exposure to others who may have uh, other respiratory infections. Okay, Legionnaire's disease. When you hear about this, you hear about a lot of people getting it because it usually occurs on some sort of um, cruise ship or in some sort of building. And this is a type of pneumonia that's caused by Legionella pneumophilia, it's called. You don't get it from people, but you get it from inhaling the bacteria that's in that building or in that system where you're residing at. It grows in the water system, in the plumbing, so like in hot tubs, shower heads, um, big plumbing systems. These patients will have one to two days of what we call prodrome, prodromal symptoms, which is really just early signs and symptoms or early symptoms. And then that's followed by high fever, dyspnea, vomiting, diarrhea, confusion, elevated white blood cell counts. So these patients are going to need antibiotics, supportive care, including respiratory support, nutritional support, and then fluid and electrolyte management. Pleural effusion. This is collection of fluid in that pleural space. These patients are going to have sharp pain in the pleuritic area that can increase when they take a breath in or with inspiration. They may have a dry, non-productive cough and decreased breath sounds over the affected area. The chest x-ray will show the pleural effusion, and this can cause a mediastinal shift where the chest organs actually move to one side of the body, um, and that can cause even further complications. For that pleural effusion, we need to identify and treat the underlying cause. The client would be placed in high Fowler's position for easier breathing, encourage coughing and deep breathing. A pleurectomy may need to be performed, and this is where we strip that parietal pleura away from the visceral pleura, or a pleurodesis, which is where we instill medication into that pleural space, and it tries to adhere um, the lung to the wall so that we can eliminate any issues within that pleural space. Pleurisy is inflammation of the visceral and the parietal membranes. It can cause a knife-like pain, which is aggravated by deep breathing and coughing. The patient may also have a pleuritic friction rub, which you can hear when you auscultate the lungs. Interventions are to apply hot or cold applications as prescribed 
and to instruct the client to lie on the affected side to help splint the chest. Empyema occurs when there's pus in the pleural cavity. This is going to cause the patient to have chest pain, coughing, shortness of breath, malaise, fever, chills, night sweats, and uh, inability to fully expand that chest wall movement on one side. Pleural um, exudates can be seen on the chest x-ray. The client will be placed in a semi-fowler or high fowler's position for easier breathing. They'll be given antibiotics and a chest tube will be inserted to help uh, get rid of that drainage. And so you're going to have to monitor for both the chest tube drainage and the patient's respiratory status. Another respiratory problem you might see in a patient is a PE or a pulmonary embolism. This occurs when a thrombus that's formed elsewhere in the body, such as the leg, dislodges and travels to the right side of the heart and then lodges there somewhere in the branch of a pulmonary artery. These patients are going to have chest pain, blood tinge sputum, a cough, cyanosis, distended neck veins, shortness of breath, hypotension, wheezes on oscillation, shallow respirations, tachycardia, and tachypnea. All right, how are we going to care for this patient with the pulmonary embolism? First thing is we're going to put them immediately in high Fowler's position so they can breathe easier. We need to maintain bed rest. If prescribed, we'll provide active and passive range of motion, monitor their pulse oximetry, and administer anticoagulation therapy such as heparin or Coumadin. Heparin is, can be given IV. Coumadin is given orally only. For these drugs, we're going to monitor uh, the clotting factors or the bleeding times. So for Coumadin or Warfarin, we're going to monitor the prothrombin time or the INR. And for heparin, we're going to monitor the partial thromboplastin time or the PTT. Heparin lasts a lot shorter than what Coumadin does. Carbon monoxide poisoning. So symptoms are often described as flu-like and commonly include headache, dizziness, weakness, vomiting, chest pain, and confusion. Large, large exposures can result in loss of consciousness, arrhythmias, seizure, or death. These patients are usually either in a house that's being um, charged by a generator, so the generator's in the garage and it's not properly ventilated. Sometimes uh, it can cause by patients leaving a car running in a garage with the garage sealed up and the fumes leak into the house or they're working in the garage. Uh, so anything that can cause um, this carbon monoxide exposure. The gas itself is odorless, tasteless, and colorless. Um, and so it's going to make the patient severely sick. Uh, a lot of times they don't even know they're being poisoned and they just pass out and then they will go into the coma or the death if they're not exposed. So these patients have to be immediately removed from the exposure, put into fresh air, um, oxygen support, basic life support. Uh, if severe, they'll receive hyperbaric chamber um, treatment. And of course, the doc, once they're brought to the ER, will get a blood sample to test for carbon monoxide levels in the blood. Histoplasmosis is another infection that we sometimes find in the lungs. This is a pulmonary fungal infection caused by histoplasma capsulatum. It's transmitted through inhalation of the spores found in contaminated soil that contains large amounts of bird or bat droppings. Data collection is going to be dyspnea, chills and fever chest pain, elevated white blood cell counts, a positive skin test for histoplasmosis, a positive agglutination test, hepatosplenomegaly. Interventions include to administer fungicidal medications as prescribed, keep the client in semi Fowler's position, monitor for nephrotoxicity from medications, amphotericin B is one of those medications. Common side effects include a reaction with fever, 
chills, and headaches soon after the medication is given, as well as kidney issues. The client should spray any areas uh, in the barn, the chicken coop, or someplace else that may be potentially contaminated with the soil with water prior to sweeping. That will eliminate the amount of dust particles that they inhale. Sarcoidosis is another issue we can find in patients. This can develop in the lungs and the uh, lymph glands and also spread to other organs in the body. Um, but we're going to talk about the effects on the lungs. So you have this uh, in the lungs, these tubercles made from the epitheloid tissue. And uh, these are basically uh, inflammatory cells that start to form lumps and they're known as granulomas. These patients are going to have night sweats, fever, weight loss, cough, nodules on their skin, polyarthritis, shortness of breath, fatigue. Uh, they may have reddish patches on their skin or other organs. They're going to do a chyme test on these patients. Uh, if it's positive, a local nodular lesion will develop. This chyme test is a skin test where part of a spleen from a patient with known sarcoidosis is injected into the skin of a patient suspected to have the disease. For these patients, we're going to administer steroids or corticosteroids to control the symptoms, monitor for temperature, we're going to increase their fluid intake, make sure they're getting frequent rest and lots of it, and encourage small but nutritious meals. Occupational lung disease. So this is lung disorders that are caused by occupational pollutants. These can be things like black lung, asbestos, uh, and the list could probably go on and on. These patients may be asymptomatic and just come in for a routine physical uh, with evidence of fibrosis on a chest x-ray. If it's chronic, the patient may experience malaise, anorexia, weight loss, severe dyspnea on exertion, and they may show massive fibrosis on a chest x-ray. Interventions would be prevention through use of a respiratory protective device, administer antitussives, anti-tuberculosis medications as prescribed, and eliminate exposure to the toxic substances. Now we're going to talk about TB a little bit, and we'll talk about this in a little more depth as we go along. So TB is a highly communicable disease. It's caused by the mycobacterium TB or tuberculosis. A lot of patients um, that are, have it uh, either improperly care for themselves or they're non-compliant with the use of treatment programs. Risk factors uh, for the disease itself are alcoholism, drinking unpasteurized milk from an infected cow, uh, being either a younger or an older person, being homeless or from a lower socioeconomic group, living in crowded conditions, uh, being an IV drug user, suffering from malnutrition, and uh, being from foreign uh, countries. Uh, transmission itself uh, is air via the airborne route by droplet infection. Once a person who is infected has received TB medication for two to three weeks as pres prescribed, the risk of transmission is greatly reduced. But again, there's a lot of problems with people being compliant with the medication. Uh, the progression of the disease occurs as the droplets enter the lung and then the bacteria from the tubercle become encapsulated. If the encapsulation doesn't occur, then the bacteria enters the lymph system and that causes inflammatory response. Primary lesions can become dormant, but they are often reactivated and this usually happens if somebody is immunocompromised or they have another infection in the body. Uh, history of the client will usually show some exposure to, to the TB, uh, a recent history of respiratory influenza. It may show previous tests for TB or a recent 
uh, vaccination of Vaxile Comet Gurin. And this is often given in other countries. Clinical manifestations of TB include fatigue, lethargy, anorexia, weight loss, low-grade fevers, chills, night sweats, persistent cough with production of blood-tinged blood sputum, and chest tightness. Now, the chest x-ray is not definitive. A lot of times, chest x-rays will be done because somebody tests positive on a TST and will do chest x-ray to actually roll out the disease. However, if uh, tuberculosis or those multi-nodular infiltrates with calcification are seen in the upper lobes, then it does suggest the TB. We can also do a sputum culture. Uh, acid fast smear helps identify the M tuberculosis, which confirms the diagnosis, but it has to be the specific acid fast for the M tuberculosis. There are other fa acid fast tests out there. After the medications are started, sputum samples are obtained to gauge how well the therapy is working. Now for diagnosis, the MAN2 skin test is the most common test done, and that's because it's the cheapest. A positive reaction on this test doesn't indicate that the patient has active disease, but it indicates they've either been exposed or uh, they have inactive disease. Once the result is positive, it remains positive for any future test. So we don't usually repeat it once it's been positive. Uh, the next uh, step to do would be a chest x-ray to look, look for the actual nod nodular or the tubercular formations in the chest. An area of induration measuring 10 mm's or more in diameter uh, is looked for on the skin in approximately 48 to 72 hours after the injection. This indicates exposure to TB. For someone with HIV infection or someone who's immunosuppressed, a reaction of 5 mm or larger would be considered positive. Once the skin test is positive, then the chest x-ray is necessary to detect either the active disease or old healed lesions. If the patient's hospitalized, respiratory isolation in a negative pressure room will be required. The nurse is required to wear that N95 particulate respirator. If the client needs to leave the room, they would wear the mask. For teaching, the client must be taught to follow the prescribed medication regimen. They also need to know about adequate nutrition and well-balanced meals. Respiratory isolation isn't necessary because any family members that would be exposed uh, would most likely have already been exposed. Instruct the patient to cover the mouth and the nose when coughing or sneezing and to dispose of tissues in, the in a plastic bag and also about the need for consistent follow-up care. A client with COPD is experiencing exacerbation of the disease. The nurse would determine that which of the following documented in this client's record is an expected finding with this client. A. Hyperinflation of the lungs documented by chest x-ray. B. A widened diaphragm documented by chest x-ray. C. A widened diaphragm documented by the chest x-ray. D. A shortened expiratory phase of the respiratory cycle. The answer was A, hyperinflation of the lungs documented by the chest x-ray. Remember in COPD that failure for uh, that when the um, patient exhales, the lungs tend to collapse at the end and air is trapped inside the lungs. And that causes hyperinflation of the lungs, which can lead to that barrel chest. A client with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who is on oxygen therapy asked the nurse why the flow rate cannot be increased to more than two liters per minute. 
The nurse responds that this would be harmful because it could A. Increase the risk of pneumonia from the drier air passages B. Dry the nasal passes, passages C. Decrease the client's oxygen-based respiratory drive or D. Decrease the client's carbon dioxide-based respiratory drive. C. Decrease the client's oxygen-based respiratory drive. Remember, the client with COPD chronically constantly experiences low levels of oxygen flow to the brain. And after a while, the body starts to adapt to that. So we can actually shut that respiratory drive off if we supply too much oxygen. So for these patients, if we need high flows or high concentration of oxygen, we can give them a Venturi mask. Um, and that mask can actually be set to provide that uh, higher concentration of oxygen.